We have seen the MSNE characterization result in the previous module and uh, even before uh, proving that we have actually used it to find uh, the MSNE of a, of a game of the um, uh, goalkeeper and shooter game. Now uh, let us uh, use this theorem to develop an algorithm in a more formal way. Uh, it is essentially the same algorithm uh, that we use to find the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium of the penalty shootout game. Uh, but uh, written a little more formally. So we are starting with a, a normal form game as given here and uh, the first thing that we'll have to do because the uh, the characterization theorem is uh, saying everything uh, on the basis of the supports, we'll first have to uh, fix the uh, support profile and we'll have to iterate over all possible support profiles. That's the way this algorithm works. Uh, so, if we go over all possible supports, so suppose for player 1, uh, the support is x1, for player 2, support is x2. So, therefore, we will, uh, for this support profile from x1 cross x2 to xn, uh, we are going to develop a feasibility program where the variables are the probability masses uh, over those strategies uh, in that support. Um, so, what, uh, what does that mean? Let us go over step by step. So sigma uh, is j. So uh, if we pick a specific player j and we look at the uh, the strategy of uh, that player j, which is living in that support. So let's say this s j is in uh, uh, capital X j, which is the support. Then we are going to define the sigma and j uh, s j as a variable in this feasibility program, which essentially says that what is the probability we are associating with that strategy. So with what probability this player is going to play that strategy. Now what we have seen in the, in the previous uh, module, the characterization theorem says that for all the strategies which are in the support for this player, uh, the, the expected utility for this player will be uh, same. So therefore uh, we can write, so this uh, is essentially a, uh, so we are here looking at uh, the player i so for player i all the other players that is j not equal to i we are multiplying their uh, probabilities of picking their respective strategies and this essentially is the expanded form of sigma minus i s minus i this one and multiply that with the utility when this player is playing this si and the other players are playing uh, s minus i and when you we are taking the uh, sum over all s minus i's in capital s minus i note that these are all finite sets so we can take the summation this is giving us the expected utility so uh, this whole uh, right hand term together is nothing but ui of si sigma minus i we have just written it uh, explicitly uh, so that we can show the dependencies on the individual uh, variables in this feasibility program and this, uh, this should be uh, uh, equal to some uh, variable, let's say wi, and this will be true for all si which are living in that support xi. So here we are um, considering player i, its support is xi, and this, uh, this equality should be, should be holding for all players i in n. So this is essentially the condition one of that, uh, st uh, of that um, uh, characterization theorem. Similarly, for all the strategies which are outside this support, so SI minus XI, uh, we have this WI, which is the, uh, the value, the expected value, that should be at least as much as uh, the expected utility uh, for any strategy that is living outside this support. So this is essentially just uh, writing out the same uh, two conditions in a more expanded form. So uh, this is condition one of that um, uh, characterization theorem, and this is the condition two for characterization theorem. The rest of the uh, conditions are nothing but the feasibility things. So essentially uh, all this uh, sigma j s j are probability masses so therefore they should be non-negative and they should sum to 1. So uh, this is this feasibility program is solved uh, for uh, for one support profile and exactly 
this is the procedure we had followed to find out the uh, the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium for that uh, penalty shootout game. Uh, we have actually uh, started with different support profiles, uh, and we have seen that for certain support profiles, you cannot. Uh, maintain this feasibility. I mean, there is no solution to this feasibility program. So we throw that out and whenever it was possible, we found out the uh, the corresponding values of the Sigma J's, SJ's for all these, all these players. And that happens to be the uh, mixed strategy Nash equilibrium for that game. So we'll have to iterate over all these uh, uh, possible support profiles and there can be a very large number of support profiles uh, because uh, this XI uh, uh, so X1, for example, can be all possible non-empty subsets of the uh, of the strategy set of player one, which is S1. So it can take this many number of uh, possible values two to the power cardinality of S1 minus one. Uh, and uh, similarly, the whole uh, support profile therefore will be the product of all these terms. So this algorithm is not really uh, the most efficient algorithm. Uh, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, this uh, feasibility program, if you look at even for a specific profile uh, of uh, supports, that feasibility program is also not a linear program unless uh, there are only two players. So if there are two players, then this number is essentially a linear. So there is only one such variable there. Otherwise, all these variables, uh, sigma j, s j s are products uh, are appearing in this uh, expression in a product form. So therefore, it's a non-linear uh, program so which is not very easy to solve but the uh, bad news is that there does not exist uh, any polynomial time algorithm for, for general uh, games which has more than two players in, in particular the problem of finding a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium is uh, what is known as PPAD complete this is a specific uh, uh, complexity class and we are not going to discuss too much about it uh, the name PPAD stands for Polynomial Parity Argument on Directed Graphs. If you are interested, you can um, search about it and uh, find out the complexity class. Uh, but uh, the, the problem of finding a mixed strategy in Ash equilibrium falls inside this class and it has been shown by these people, Daskalakis, Goldberg and Papa Dimitriou in 2009. All right, so uh, with that, let us now come to uh, that type of algorithm where you are you are removing uh, the dominated strategy. So remember, for finding a pure strategy Nash equilibrium, we were just removing the dominated strategies, the purely dominated strategies. We are going to use a very similar thing, but now we have the flexibility of removing those uh, strategies for players which are dominated by a mixed strategy of the same player. So uh, earlier we were just looking at the uh, domination by another pure strategy but now we can even talk about mixed strategies the mixture of uh, two or more strategies uh, essentially giving rise to the uh, the dominance so in this game so let us look at this specific game here uh, can we uh, actually see some kind of a dominated strategy here definitely we cannot find any uh, purely dominated strategy so uh, let's say if we look at player one, uh, none of these strategies T, M or B dominate each other. Uh, similarly for player two, there is no strategy which, uh, which purely dominates the other strategies. But if you look at this strategy, so where uh, you are picking half, so this strategy T with probability half and strategy M with probability half, then you are taking the, uh, the, uh, the mixed uh, so the expected uh, utility that this player is getting when it's playing uh, half and half so four four and half this will be 2.5 and if you take uh, this strat uh, this uh, expected utility then it will be uh, uh, six plus two uh, times half which is four but that number actually is this that mixed number is larger than this uh, three and that mixed number is larger than two so therefore half uh, t and uh, half m this mixed strategy actually dominates b so this is this is a, a observation that was not possible that were, we did not consider uh, when we discussed about this kind of games uh, because in pure strategy in equilibrium we are uh, trying to find the pure domination domination of uh, uh, 
uh, of the strategies by, by another pure strategy. But here we can actually do that even for mixed strategies. So uh, what we can say formally is that if a pure strategy SI is strictly dominated by a mixed strategy, let's say sigma i, then in every mixed strategy of that game, SI is chosen with probability zero. You can take a look at the standard textbooks to, to find this proof. However, the intuition of the proof is uh, very much similar. So uh, because now we are in the mixed strategy world, we can actually think about the uh, domination by, by a mixed strategy. And because uh, uh, we have some strategies which are strictly dominated by a mixed strategy of the same player, then we can, without loss of generality, remove that strategy. As if the player, whenever it was thinking about playing that strategy, uh, it, it can always improve, strictly improve its uh, its payoff by choosing the mixed strategy which has dominated it. So therefore, there is no reason why it should be picked and uh, the, a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium will never choose that. This theorem essentially formally proves that. However, there is a good news about uh, mixed strategy Nash equilibrium and that is uh, by a result due to John Nash in 1951. Uh, which shows that um, every finite game has a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. What does that uh, uh, mean, uh, the finite game? That means the number of players and the number of strategies for each of these players are finite. Now this uh, proof is uh, not very difficult to, uh, to do. Uh, at least uh, we can do it for two players and uh, show it uh, very easily. Uh, but I will not spend time to uh, go over the proof in the in the module itself. Rather, I will post a note where the uh, where each of these steps you can you can read about it. But to read that note, there are certain um, ideas, some some mathematical tools that will be needed, and some results that will be needed from real analysis. That is what I am going to uh, explain in this uh, in the rest of the time. So uh, the first uh, notion is about uh, convexity. I am sure that you know what a convex set is. So a set, uh, and here we are only dealing with uh, subsets of r to the power n to keep things uh, simple. The definition of con convexity is even general, but we are only looking at uh, an n-dimensional real space. So it is convex if we, uh, if for every uh, x and y that lives in this space, so if we look at a set S, for every two elements, uh, if you join the chord between these two points, that is going to always live within that set. So uh, to give an example, uh, so let us look at a two-dimensional plane and let us look at a, a specific set uh, which looks like this. Is this a convex set? The answer is no, because you can always pick some x and y here, where if you take some uh, convex combination, so if you take a combination of these two points and you go to a point which is lying outside the set, uh, that, uh, that violates the definition of convexity, so therefore this set is not convex. So what will be the shape of a convex set? Something like a circle or things. Uh, which does not have such kind of uh, uh, situations where if you draw a chord between two points in that set that goes outside the set. Okay, so the second uh, property, the second uh, definition uh, uh, is about closedness. So we say that a set is closed when it contains all its limit points. So what does a limit point mean? So points, so limit points are those kind of points uh, for a set where every neighborhood of that set uh, contains a point in S. So let us uh, think about this. So suppose I have a point and we are going to define this as a limit point. If you draw any arbitrarily small uh, ball around it, let's say we are still living in the two dimensional space. So I, I draw a small circle uh, with uh, with a radius epsilon and this epsilon can be arbitrarily small. It, it just requires to be positive, but it can be arbitrarily small. Uh, and for every such uh, circle, no matter however small it is, so you will have some points of S that lives within that. So one uh, classic example uh, for uh, an, uh, a limit point uh, of a set is when the set is, let's say, 0, 1 open 
uh, when it is open on this uh, one it means that it is uh, it does not contain one but the all the numbers which are arbitrarily close to one that lives it inside this set now we claim that one is a limit point to this set because uh, if you have this uh, real line where it is closed at zero but open at one that means if you are sitting at one and you draw an arbitrarily small circle like this then every such circle will uh, will have some point which is living in this zero one open interval think about it uh, and uh, you'll, you'll see this uh, this will take some uh, time to sink in but the uh, but the point that i'm trying to make about this limit points is quite uh, quite easy to follow so once we have such limit points, we will not call this, this kind of a set 0, 1 open uh, to be a closed set because there exists some uh, limit point. So uh, here the limit point is 1 uh, of this set which is not contained within that set. So if we instead had 0, 1 which is closed, that is we also include the, the point 1 into this set, then it becomes closed. closed. Uh, and there does not exist any other point which is a limit point uh, and that is not inside this set. So that is uh, one important notion. So we need uh, the, this property of closeness. Boundedness is very, uh, uh, very simple. We already know by the term itself, we know what a, what a bounded set is. So what, uh, what does it say formally? We will say a set to be bounded if there exists some point x0 in R, uh, R to the N. Notice that this X0 need not be inside this set S and uh, some uh, finite R. So this uh, should be larger than 0 and should be smaller than infinite. So uh, it is a finite uh, radius R such that if you look at every uh, point, so for every uh, X that is living in X, if you take the difference between the distance between X0 and X, uh, and we are just looking at the L2 norm, uh, that should be smaller than R. So let's say we have a set S uh, which is looking like this. Uh, it, it is in, uh, uh, let's say it is in R2 again, uh, two dimensional plane. And suppose there is X0 and there is a X0 and there is a radius, let's say R. And then you, you can draw this uh, circular uh, ball around this x0 point all the points that you can uh, pick from this set s the uh, euclidean distance between x and x0 will be bounded within that r so if we can do this this kind of a uh, uh, we can ensure this property then we say that this set s is essentially bounded now you can play around with these properties you can see uh, the conditions where it is convex but not closed closed but not convex, uh, closed and convex but not bounded and so on. You can actually uh, create examples uh, of all sorts and uh, that will essentially make your understanding better. Now we are going to uh, call a set to be compact if it is closed and bounded. So uh, we are just uh, using the fact that uh, this uh, uh, we are living in this R, R to the n. So these are only uh, real spaces uh, for so there is a different definition of compactness when it is not r to the n but since we are here uh, it's easy uh, so every set in r to the n which is closed and bounded that is also compact so that's uh, uh, what we are going to use now uh, a result from real analysis that we are going to state and this this result will be very much uh, useful in proving the uh, the nash theorem uh, this is called the Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So what is a fixed point? Fixed point is nothing but a, uh, a point where a, uh, a function uh, gets mapped to the same point where it started from. So let's say we have a function which is starting from x and it is mapping to x, the same set. Then uh, if there exists some x uh, which uh, when you apply f to it, and get fx that value is nothing but x itself so if you want to draw a figure in two dimensions uh, this is nothing but uh, so and suppose we have a function like f of x so on the y-axis we are plotting fx and on the x-axis we have x 
then what it uh, what a fixed point is saying is that it is the point where it is crossing this x uh, y equal to x line so this point here is a fixed point because at this uh, point uh, whatever that x uh, let's say x star is uh, the value of that f x star is nothing but x star itself so therefore uh, we call that point to be a uh, to be a uh, fixed point now this Brouwer's fixed point theorem is saying that uh, if uh, if you have a set s that is convex and compact and if you have a function which maps uh, the, that, that set into itself uh, and the uh, function is also continuous then it says that t has a fixed point so that means that there exists some x star in s uh, which maps uh, uh, which is getting mapped to itself uh, via this function tx uh, we are not going to prove this result uh, th this uh, proof is a little uh, complicated rather uh, it's al already a very well known result but i can give you an illustration of uh, this result in in two dimensions so suppose we have a we have a very similar thing we have t on the uh, on the y axis t of x and we have x on the x axis and uh, we know that this function is uh, so suppose uh, it is mapping some interval here so 0 to m or something uh, this this interval into itself so on the y axis you also have 0 to m now this function looks something like this maybe like this um, and the this result is saying that you can always find some point which passes through this y equal to x line and that uh, you can you can uh, clearly see that this is definitely going to be possible because this is a function it has to uh, give some value at each point from 0 to m and because this is continuous can you ever draw a function which uh, does not pass through this you can't because this is uh, this is like a box and you are going from one point to another and uh, try out different ways of drawing a continuous line on this uh, uh, which has values uh, from from every point from 0 to m uh, you can never find any point which uh, does not pass through y equal to x yes if it is if it was a discontinuous function then you could have uh, drawn something like t equal to t uh, is uh, of this value here and then after that it it changes its value so in that case it might not intersect with that y equal to x line but as long as the function is continuous, yeah, this uh, uh, this fixed point is guaranteed to exist, and the Brouwer's fixed point theorem is essentially saying that.